good day everyone and thank you for joining us on our SCTG webinar this morning or afternoon depending on your coastal orientation. This is Anthony Raj speaking from the Educational and Community Supports Unit at the University of Oregon and it is my pleasure to be hosting the webinar titled Using Data and Data Systems to Address Discipline Disproportionality presented by Therese Sandomirsky and Don Kincaid. Therese is a Technical Assistant Specialist with Florida's Positive Behavior Support Project. She's the co-lead for a project workgroup addressing disproportionate discipline and oversees the development and implementation of a statewide database for behavioral data. She's also an independent consultant for school districts in Texas and has been an ad hoc reviewer for the Journal of Positive Behavior Interventions. Dawn is the Division Co-Director of Applied Research and Educational Support at the Florida Center for Inclusive Communities and a professor of Child and Family Studies at USF. He's an investigator on a number of positive behavior support projects and also teaches at the university level while serving on a number of editorial and advisory boards in the area of positive behavior supports. I know you're all excited to be here and I would like to encourage you to take notes, ask questions and interact via the chat box. Just a quick reminder that if you are dialing in, to please mute your phone via the star six key combo. With that, I'll hand over to Therese and Don. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, we are excited to do this presentation. This is Don Kincaid. I'll be uh, turning it over to Therese Sandomirsky in just a moment. Uh, but this is again a webinar uh, hosted by the School Climate Transformation Grant uh, supports and available to everyone across the country uh, that is implementing school-wide PBIS strategies as well as other individuals that just might be interested in the, in the topic. Uh, so um, we're going to go ahead and, and begin the presentation and if you have any questions uh, I know you're muted so you can't ask the question but if you do it in the chat box I will relay the question to uh, to Therese or we can save some time at the end hopefully for some for some discussion. So our goal of this presentation is to describe the features of a data system that support the addressing of equitable, out, equitable outcomes for all student groups and how to use quantitative data as well as qualitative data to identify and define disproportionate discipline pat patterns and also look at other kinds of data sources that will pinpoint some of the causes of overrepresentation in discipline data. So um, I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Therese. Uh, this is the easiest presentation I've ever done because Therese is the guru and the expert on the data and this process for the state of Florida. And you're in good hands with understanding what we're doing uh, to address this issue. She's learned from folks across the country and now she's helping to inform folks across the country in how to address equity. And so I'm turning it over to Therese. Awesome. Thank you very much, Don. Um, if folks can hear me, why don't you start by typing in, into the chat pod. Let us know what part of the country you guys are from. Yeah, that's awesome. Oklahoma, right in the middle. That's great. Thank you, guys. Good to see you guys. I'm really, really glad that you could make it today. Um, as we're getting going, I just want to point out that the session norms for all my sessions is to just acknowledge that we are all learning through this process and no one has the whole idea about equity figured out yet. Um, so if you hear something that sounds odd or contradictory, then please say something. And that includes if I say something that doesn't quite seem right to you. Uh, be supportive of others' participation and feedback. Uh, recognize that folks are speaking their truth. And even if it's not something you immediately relate to, just to stay engaged and try to understand where they come from. Um, finally, there are no stupid questions, except like my high school teacher told me, the ones that are not asked. So uh, please, if anything pops up, that isn't clear, go ahead and type into the chat and Don or myself will jump in there for you. 
So um, as we begin today, let's clarify first what we mean by a data system. It's not just the database that houses all of your information. It's everything that happens before the information gets to your database and everything that happens after the information is entered into your database. And if we want to have equitable outcomes for all student groups, then we need to make a decision at the district and possibly state levels, do we want to create data systems that support students with culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, um, or do we want to create data systems that obscure their experiences? Um, because this is such a relatively new area of focus for schools, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the data systems have not kept up with the need um, in education. But today we're going to learn about some features that will help to start address those needs. So we're going to start with data collection. What goes into that system? So um, demographic information. If you are concerned about equity, then demographics must be included with all types of data collection that you do. Generally speaking, the stuff that you're required to do as a part of um, your district reporting or your state reporting requirements, things like discipline, attendance, and achievement, um, you're usually pretty good with those data systems because somewhere when you add that student to your district database, we're keeping track of racial demographics, at least. Um, also disability status, gender, and the, um, those standard demographic variables. The places where schools and districts tend to have less focus on race and other demographic information are things like their climate surveys. Um, here in Florida, unless districts are paying a lot of money to another organization that does a really nice climate survey, um, many times those climate surveys cannot be disaggregated. So they'll uh, show us the results from the climate surveys and it looks like 80% of their respondents were really, really happy with school climate, but then schools are unable to answer the degree to which the groups that are impacted by disproportionate discipline, to what degree do they feel the same way? Is school climate working for them? So adding race, adding um, the federal categories for race, subcategories for race, disability status, adding those to your data collection um, efforts will help you understand that part of the problem. Um, the other areas to think about different ways that you might be able to collect that information has to do with participation in tier one events, uh, lesson plans, as well as reward events, a percentage of tokens that are received by students of different backgrounds, and those sorts of things. There is some very recent research that's coming out showing that participation in reward systems is really a key area for increasing equity. Um, so in addition to disproportionate discipline, we have frequently underrepresentation in the positive side of school-wide support systems. Um, but if we're not looking at that variable, then we really don't know if that's true for our individual school or not. So looking at the different demographic variables that are here on the slide, um, go ahead and type into the chat box, do some of these categories seem easier to collect than others? And are there any that are missing? I see you guys are typing. I appreciate that. Yes, uh, Kristen, you picked up on the one that I figured would stand out for folks. That is a, a big area um, where we get a lot of pushback from our schools. Yeah, those things are, are definitely difficult to collect. Yeah, we, so we have some consensus uh, emerging around LGBTQ. Um, socioeconomic status came up as one that's difficult to collect. Okay, that's very good. So this is definitely a challenging area. Um, and in many places where we go in Florida, LGBTQ is not even acknowledged. We actually had some districts not too long ago ban the gay-straight alliance clubs at their schools um, because they didn't want to, in any way, shape, or form, seem like they were promoting <laughs> anything other than heteronormative standards. Um, however, 
there is research coming out and it's done mostly by private organizations like um, well, there's the National LGBTQ Task Force. Uh, there's also GLSEN uh, that did a couple of surveys. Um, and what they found is that students who identify as LGBTQ, the majority of those students feel unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation. 59% uh, of LGBTQ youth report having been bullied, not by other peers, but by their teachers. 59% of LGBTQ youth report having been bullied by their teachers. And 30% of LGBTQ youth reported that they missed at least one day of school in the past month because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable at school. Um, another finding from this particular set of research, it was from the National LGBTQ Task Force, is that of the LGBTQ youth who have been bullied, uh, about half of those youth attempted suicide. So although this is an area that's uncomfortable sometimes to bring up and can be challenging to collect data around, it's something that is important. Um, and there is actually a new tool out there, and I'll show that in a second, that will help us with that data collection. Another... Hey, Therese? Yes, Don. Uh, this is Don. I did want to interrupt because there was a, con a question earlier about the citation for research showing systems per, uh, reward systems persist participation uh, helps with equity and there are two studies out um, and it will be included in a future equity concept guidance brief uh, from Tobin and then another one by Barclay a former graduate student of ours that indicates that those uh, is a critical feature of PBIS that will have an impact on the uh, decreasing the discipline gap Thank you, Don. So that research is so new that it's still in press. <laughs> yep. Okay. One of them, one of them, brand new article. Wonderful. So. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Another area to consider is the intersectionality of different demographic variables. And what um, many studies are finding is that if you belong to more than one at-risk demographic group, then your level of risk for different events increases at least by that amount. Um, so there are some different examples presented here on the slide. This is from the Discipline Disparities Research to Practice Collaborative. Um, and some of these statistics are, are kind of mind-blowing. Um, the National Council on Crime and Delinquency also provided some information around LGBTQ uh, girls and youth in juvenile justice settings. And you can see that there is a high, high degree of overlap uh, in terms of different demographic group identities and exposure to either discipline or um, juvenile justice settings. So I mentioned that there was going to be a tool that is free to all schools in the country. Uh, this is offered by the OSEP TA Center for PBIS. Uh, it's called PBIS Assessment and they offer a number of different tools but one of the tools that they recently released was a school climate survey. Uh, and it's a brief school climate survey. Uh, you can use it with students in grade 3 through 12. It's a 10 to 15 minute assessment. I think at most you guys will see a little sample of questions in just a minute. Uh, you can do this on paper, pencil, or online. It gives you some disaggregated and descriptive results. And you can download those results into Excel so you can have a little bit more flexibility with your data. Um, so this is a little bit difficult to see, but one of the questions right here in terms of demographics, um, and this is for the elementary level, is what is your gender or gender identity? And so the students who are taking this survey have the opportunity right up front to identify um, or they can opt out of answering. At the secondary level, it's um, a very similar type of question. What is your gender or gender identity? And here they get a little bit more specific with transgender. But again, they allow kids the option to opt out. Um, then you can also identify your sexual orientation. And we're also identifying ethnicity and race at both levels there. So the types of questions are easy, straightforward. Um, again, it's not a lot of questions. I think it's maybe 15 questions or so, um, but it's a very short survey, relatively easy to administer, and that is free to all schools. So that's pbisassessments.org. Or if you just Google 
EDIS assessments. Now you can get access to that. Some of the reports that come out, um, what this shows you is surveys that have been administered at different points in the school year. Um, so you can break it down overall and then by quarter. And this is year over year. Another example where we can view our school climate results by race, ethnicity. And this is for several, this is within the same year, I believe. And then it also breaks down by gender identity. So beyond capturing uh, demographic information from our students, from our families, uh, there are other issues with data collection that become really relevant when you're addressing equity and school outcomes. Um, the biggest one that we run into just deals with basic tier one fidelity. Um, so what does the discipline process look like for your school and is it utilized consistently by all of your staff members? Uh, what are your behavior definitions? Do the majority of your staff interpret the same behavior approximately the same way. Uh, completing forms, are they filling out the staff that observed the incident, the location where the incident occurred, or are they substituting different information in those fields? And then two, getting those referrals entered into the database in a timely manner so that teams can use the information to make timely decisions. Um, there's also an issue with restitution. In many cases, when students are suspended, uh, they have the opportunity to engage in some act of service that will either eliminate or reduce the number of days that they have to serve. And many times, um, the incident is entered into the data system and the student completes that restitution activity, but then the data entry clerk fails to go back and update those records. So it's real basic making sure we have good information coming into our system so we can make good decisions when it comes out. Um, but this becomes especially important when you're trying to address disproportionate discipline. Um, and that is because of people's typical reactions when they see disproportionate discipline happens at their school. So folks, type into the chat pod, what are some typical reactions you've heard or seen when people find out that their school has disproportionate discipline outcomes. That's good. So we're seeing um, there are a lot of excuses. Uh, people don't want to talk about it. Shock. <laughs> that is a big one. Oh, yes. Blaming the parents. It's almost like you guys have a copy of the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> um, and I forget if you actually got the copy or not, but uh, you will if you haven't already. But yeah, what you're describing there in the chat pod is exactly what we've seen time and time and time again. Uh, we've been focusing pretty extensively on disproportionate discipline for the last few years, and it's getting pretty predictable in terms of how people respond when they find out they are a part of one of the schools with disproportionate outcomes. Um, but almost automatically, we see that people's first reaction is to question or deny the data. And so if you have a discipline process that's not being used consistently by your staff, then when your staff find out that they have disproportionate discipline, that's the place that they go to um, as an immediate explanation for why the outcomes are disproportionate. Um, and that's what they'll hang their hat on. Now, in some cases, if you do have an inconsistent discipline process, then it's great that they're taking the opportunity to address that and get a more consistent process in place. That's going to help all of your students um, overall, and it will probably help with equity as well. That's what's been reported by at least one of our districts as recently as this week. Uh, but then if there are other deeper issues going on and people are still focused and blaming the data uh, or how the data is collected or reported, then you'll never get to those root causes of the problem. So we've got to get our data system straight to support our students. 
Now, I mentioned data sharing. So once you have all that quantitative data, all those numbers in front of you from your office discipline referrals and suspensions, that's just one side of the story. That's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, you need to reach out and get others' perspectives on those numbers in order to really start to get a sense about what's going on and why it might be occurring on your campus. So I, I think that education overall over the last decade or so has gotten really good about using data to make decisions. Um, but it's almost to the point where it's the only source of information we're using to try to address real problems in our school. And everyone who works with discipline data knows it's an imperfect data source. It's never going to explain everything that it needs to explain for you to intervene effectively. So we need to reach out to others and see how they react to those same numbers. Um, what this does too is when you go out and you share the information with your families and students, which I will talk more about very shortly, um, it gives an opportunity for those stakeholders to validate the problem. And, and this is true for your staff as well. Um, so if they have an opportunity to weigh in, maybe correct a misunderstanding in the data, then this is a, a wonderful way for them to do so before you get too far deep into different interventions and different strategies. Um, also for your families and students, they get the message that the issue is being taken seriously by leadership. And probably the most important piece is that they feel their perspective is important uh, for addressing the problem. And having done the family and student focus groups, that's something that our families reported as being extremely valuable to them and very meaningful for them. So sharing that data, getting that qualitative side of the story is critical. Um, you do want to go about it in a way that is smart, that, that's intelligent, so you're talking to the folks that you need to reach. Um, so first of all, you've got to make sure that if you have disproportionate discipline, you're talking to the families and students who are impacted by disproportionate discipline. Um, so if your African American students are overrepresented over in school discipline, then you want to make sure you're talking to their families. Um, you want to think about the number of referrals received by students within that target group. Uh, if you have a lot of students who have many, many referrals, then you want to make sure that your focus groups reflect students who have a lot of referrals. If on the opposite end, um, your target group, really they only just get one referral or one suspension, then you'll have a, a focus group that's a little bit um, more reflective of that. Uh, you don't want to only include families that have issues with discipline, maybe also include one or two families that have no referrals. So they do belong to your target group, but they haven't contacted discipline. They can lend a very valuable perspective as well. And then the final thing is to not just focus on race, but also consider some other characteristics that are common to your target group. Um, so I mentioned before about intersectionality having um, a big impact on risk to um, negative outcomes in school. Uh, this would be one way to start to chip away at that idea. Um, so different things to consider is ethnicity. Um, maybe you have a large Haitian population or a large Colombian population. Um, if that's true for your school, then make sure that some of those folks are invited to that focus group. Um, if you have students with disabilities in your target group, make sure they're included as well. Thinking about time and country, state or neighborhood, common pre-K centers or after-school centers, et cetera. Um, and then thinking about having a variety of grade levels, academic levels, or siblings and other grades, which will help you broaden the amount of feedback you're getting or broaden the perspective um, of discipline at your school. So not every school will have different characteristics that really stand out for their target group, but in schools where you do, then it's important to know that and to make sure that your group is reflective of those different characteristics. When you do focus groups, if you think about how Pepsi or Coca-Cola or just about any major company, when they go out to get people's opinions, they don't ask everybody who uses their product. Um, they keep those groups limited, and we're recommending less than 10 people, so maybe invite 10, and if you're lucky, 6 to 8 will show up. Uh, but what that does is it really allows each person to contribute to the discussion. Um, you want to keep an eye out for the balance between the numbers of families and students and staff members. Also, because we're paying attention to race in order to address equity, we want to pay attention to the racial balance of the group as well. 
Um, it usually takes a good two hours, um, at least 90 minutes, to get folks comfortable with one another and allow them to share. And um, every time that we've done a focus group, people have wanted to come back and have additional sessions. Um, so plan for that as something to be incorporated into a way of work so that you can develop ongoing positive relationships with your different stakeholder groups. Um, it's not all on school personnel. Uh, you do have folks in your district or um, maybe even at your state level who can help with family or community engagement. Um, and sometimes in situations where school personnel feel really, really um, hesitant <laughs> to reach out to members uh, that are impacted by disproportionate discipline, then you can also consider enlisting a family advocate to help with those invitations to come and share their perspectives. Um, so this particular piece of the presentation, I could get into a lot more detail for, um, but we do have some limited time today, so I don't want to exclusive, uh, fo focus exclusively on that. Um, but that's something to keep an eye out. If you're interested in doing focus groups, uh, then your state PBIS uh, project should be able to help you with that. Um, also, feel free to uh, check out our website. You can get in touch with myself or Don if you'd like. So all of that was on collecting data. So then now let's shift our focus to how that data is reported. So we've got a poll question for you. Thank you, Anthony. And pretty soon, uh, yes, there we go. So what I would like you guys to respond to is um, to answer what type of information is provided to your school? What type of information can you access? Uh, so can you get access to the number of students who receive discipline who belong to a particular group? So for example, of all the students who receive suspension, 60% are black. Can you get access to the number of referrals given to students of a particular group? So for example, 45% of referrals were given to Hispanic or Latino, Latina students. Or can you get the number of enrolled students by demographic group? So 15% of our student body is multiracial. And for the folks who are responding here, it looks like most everybody can get all of these different pieces of information. And that's really encouraging. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. <laughs> there we go. All right, guys, thank you for responding to that. Uh, the reason why I paused to get that specific information is because those three pieces of information, uh, the number of students receiving discipline, the number of referrals given to students, and the number of students enrolled, um, those are critical pieces of information for really understanding what's going on with your school if you have disproportionate outcomes. And it's always something that you don't notice until you start disaggregating your data. Um, very, very frequently uh, here in Florida, we have schools that um, their data systems report a snapshot enrollment count. So uh, very commonly in October, we find out how many kids we have and we can disaggregate that by race, uh, but that's October. And now we're looking at end of year discipline numbers and we're seeing that the number of kids who receive discipline exceed the number of kids enrolled in the school. Uh, and that's because the, those different um, measures don't match up. Uh, students who transfer schools, we sometimes see that the counts must uh, go with the student. So one day school A may have grossly disproportionate outcomes and the next day because a student transferred they have equitable outcomes and that seems kind of odd um, but that's how it happens. Uh, how does your data system handle students receiving an IEP in the middle of the year? Are they counted as a student with a disability and all of their discipline falls into that category? Or are you able to split those by when the student was identified as having that disability? <clears throat> Excuse me. Also knowing the size of your enrollment and the overall levels of discipline for your school is really important for understanding why some of your disproportionality metrics look the way that they do. So if you can get those three pieces of information, the enrollment, kids with discipline, and number of discipline events, then you'll be in a position where you can address all of these ideas at a glance. That will also allow you to calculate just about any equity metric that you would like to use. Uh, the 
IDEA data guide uh, published in May 2014. They offered some recommendations for how to assess disproportionality in special education, and they said that multiple measures must be used, but they did not say which measures. So having those three pieces of information will allow you to calculate just about all of them. Uh, what I have here for you is a demonstration of why that might be important. Uh, so this graph shows you a risk ratio for African-American students to receive a referral, uh, and that shows you that information on a month-to-month -month basis. The green line that you see at the bottom of the graph here, this is the end-of-the-year risk ratio value, or the cumulative risk ratio value. And so what you can see clearly is the risk ratio value on a monthly basis, it jumps all over the place. So at the beginning of the year, we think we're doing great. Um, maybe in January, we're panicking because we have disproportionate outcomes and they're really, really horrible. Uh, but then the next month in February, suddenly it doesn't look as bad as it did. Uh, so those risk ratios are highly variable. The other thing with risk ratios is that you can get a zero value <laughs> for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, and we have the example here, in August we had a risk ratio value of zero because African American students were the only group to receive a referral. Uh, but in September, the risk ratio was zero because there were no African American students who received a referral. So the risk ratio is a nice summary measure to tell you about disparities in your school, but it can't be used to track progress over time. Um, it's a little bit too variable for that. Another advantage to having multiple metrics. Uh, if we start off and uh, what we're looking at here are some numbers for two different schools. Uh, example one for African American students and example two for African American students. And you guys can see the risk ratio values for those two schools. And which of these examples would you say has the worst disproportionality? Example one or example two? You can type that into chat. <laughs> so which of these schools has the worst disproportionality? Thank you, Jared. Number two, I would agree with that. That risk ratio value is higher at example two than it is for example one. Now, what is your opinion once you find out about the enrollment for this school? In school number one over here, uh, we have uh, African-American students making up 8% of the student body. That's 138 students. In school number two, we have African-American students making up 14% of the student body, and that's only 42 students. So now, would you guys want to focus on school number two or school number one? And there's no right answers in this file. Hey, Sue, thank you. Yeah, so a couple of folks are now saying school number one needs a little bit of help. I'm just curious, why would you guys want to focus on school one now that you know more about the enrollment? Yep, there are more kids involved. That's a, a very straightforward explanation, absolutely. So then, if we break that down, look at a little bit more information. If we look at the number of African American students who received an office discipline referral, we can see that 17% of the kids who receive office referrals are African American at school one. That's 93 students. Over here, in school number two, 43% of the students who receive referrals are African American, and that's three kids. So now, knowing that, would you go with school one or school two? Which one would you want to focus on? We're sticking with one? Definitely one. And, no, oh, we've got another answer. We definitely have some consensus here on school number one. What if I point out the degree of disparity? We look at African American students making up 8% of the student body here and 17% of the students who receive referrals. This percentage is about twice as high as that percentage. In school number two, African American students make up about 14% of the student body, but 43% of the students who receive referrals. So the disparity in school number two, the percentage point difference here, is a lot higher 
than it is over here. Yep, there you go, Kristen. I see you typing into chat. So the percentage is higher in school number two. So it's a hard call. I agree. If we look at office discipline referrals that were given out at school number one, African American students received 25% of office discipline referrals. School number two, African American students received 72% of the referrals. I'm going to show you a couple more examples just so we can tie this off. Uh, the referral rate, this breaks down the number of referrals given to African American students divided by enrollment for African American students. And at school one, we're seeing that African American students have a 2.64 referral per black student rate. That's the referral rate, 2.64. Whereas at school two, the referral rate is 0.5 referrals per black student. So we had to say this in real terms. At school one, there are enough referrals given to African American students that every African American student could have at least two referrals. At school number two, it would take one referral for every two African American students. So now looking at that, would you guys go with school one or school two? One is certainly starting to look a little worse. Now this is usually the point when school teams would start to point out, well, there's a lot more kids here. Um, what does the rest of the school look like? And so you can turn that referral rate into a referral ratio, which is a lot like a risk ratio, where everything higher than one suggests overrepresentation, and the further away from one you get, um, the more disproportionality you have. And so suddenly, when we start to consider the referral rate for other groups of students, then school number two clearly looks a lot worse than school number one. And then if we break that down and we look at the percentage of African American students who are affected, then we can see that two thirds of black students at it in school number one have contacted discipline versus 7% of African American students at school number two. So take a moment, type into chat, and let me know, now that you see all of these different pieces of information, which school would you want to focus on and why? Yes, Martina, is this that you, Stephanie? <laughs> All right, so we've got Christopher wanting to help the first school. The risk is much higher. It's impacting a lot more kids. Much higher percentage of that population. And we have Jared, while both schools can use assistance, school one is impacting more kids. Kristen, I would want to focus on school one since the disproportionality is affecting more students. However, you feel like there may be another factor impacting a smaller group of African American students in group two. Wow, Kristen, that is actually my very, very next slide. Um, so you nailed it. Uh, knowing this information when you're trying to identify the scope of the problem at your school, will absolutely help you understand better how to intervene. So what we see in cases where the enrollment might be a little bit low or the overall amount of discipline may be a little bit low, the outcomes are still disproportionate for that particular group. Uh, if there's overrepresentation, there is overrepresentation. It could be in the amount of kids who are impacted or the amount of discipline that they're receiving. Um, but looking at multiple aspects of disproportionality will help your teams understand how to intervene. At school number one, you're probably looking at tier one adjustments so that you can reach all of those kids that are being impacted by disproportionate discipline. Unless, of course, you do have the resources where you can provide small group support um, for upwards of 90 kids. 
At school number two, you do still have disproportionate discipline. Um, it's a much smaller number of kids. You might be able to intervene at school number two with something that looks more at a small group or even an individual intervention, like maybe uh, a mentoring sort of a program. So good. Thank you guys for typing into chat. I know that was a lot of information to process at once. So if you have multiple metrics, it's real easy to get lost in the data. And so what we coach our teams to do is to always go into data analysis uh, with a set of questions that they need an answer for. So these are our guiding questions. And what it boils down to is what's the minimum amount of information you need to speak about a particular issue? So <clears throat> let's see. Yep, we do have a tool for you. And what I'm going to do is type the link into the chat pod there. So you guys should be able to click on that hyperlink and it'll take you straight to one of our live finders that's on our website. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, you can go to www.flpbis.org and then click on Evaluation. And from there, if you scroll down, it's binder number four, Equity and Climate Resources. Uh, but what, what we have to offer you um, is two tools, depending how deep you want to go into the data. Uh, the equity profile is either the complete tool or just the first tab on the second tool. And what this does is if you have those three critical pieces of information that we mentioned before, the enrollment, kids who receive discipline, and the total number of discipline events from the group, then all of those different metrics will calculate automatically for you. All you have to do is enter the numbers, the rest appear. And for those who are intimidated by numbers, I'm one of them, um, you can scroll down below that table and all of those different metrics are written out for you so you have some idea of what they're trying to tell you. So the equity profile, it color codes the metrics according to which of those guiding questions they best answer. Uh, so for question one, are outcomes equitable for all groups of students? In this first column here for student composition, the cell is going to turn red if they have disproportionate discipline. Um, you could also look at the referral ratio and see anything higher than like a 1.3 or a 1.5. Um, that starts to get disproportionate. Uh, so you could also use that. But we kind of like just looking for the red cells because we know we have to do something there. Those cells turn red based on a background formula. And I don't want to get too much into the math here for you guys, but if you remember from your statistics classes that normal distribution, um, it, what the E formula will do is it's going to look at your student composition. And if your student composition falls within uh, one standard deviation uh, of the range for your school, then the cell stays green. If your student composition is higher than that, then it turns red and you know it's something that you need to address. Now this gets a little bit fancy, uh, but we found that it was a really, really good measure. Um, here in Florida, we have a lot of schools where different, or I'll say non-white student groups make up a relatively small percentage of the student population. And we re were repeatedly running into situations where disproportionate outcomes were dismissed because it's just a handful of kids or it's such a small percentage of our population. Well, the E formula takes that into account. It also takes into account the amount of discipline overall that's being used at your school. Um, so the E formula is not impacted by students who receive multiple, multiple discipline events. Um, it reduces the likelihood that a group is falsely identified as having disproportionate outcomes. So um, in some situations, you might get a risk ratio of 6.5, and that looks very, very disproportionate, but it's because you have small numbers going into the equation. Um, so that, uh, the E formula controls for that. And it was recommended by OSEP, so that's good enough for me. The middle part of the tool is color-coded yellow, and that will answer the question, how big are the disparities? Uh, for, those, for that question, we use the risk ratio, and then we look at the difference between the student enrollment and the percent of kids who receive discipline. Uh, that's the difference in student composition. And then the difference in referral composition is the difference between enrollment and the percentage of referrals received by students in a particular group. Um, the bottom line here is with the risk ratio, anything over one suggests disproportionate outcomes. And then the difference in student composition, if you have a positive value, then that suggests disproportionate values as well. Uh, with risk ratios, remember that 1.0 is equal. 
And the further away you get from that, um, the more disproportionate your outcomes are. Uh, if you get higher than three, that's, that's more than three times higher risk for that particular group. Now, if you get a very high risk ratio, like seven or higher, um, that's usually because you have fewer than 10 students somewhere in the equation that goes into your risk ratio. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. The final column there is for risk, and that tells you how much of your target group is impacted by disproportionate discipline. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward for people to see, but it, it does help them identify the scope of their problem. So that was the equity profile. That is the first tab in the problem definition template. Um, if you open the problem definition template, what you'll see is that there are a number of tabs across the bottom of that file. And so if you continue to enter data into these tabs, you'll get more information. Jared, I see your question. I'm going to get to that right at the end, if that's OK. So with the problem definition template, the second tab has you look at school-wide data. So you're identifying the most common uh, problem behaviors, the most common location, the most common time for all kids in your school, including those in your target group. Uh, so you just complete those, open fields, and then if the cell turns white over here, then that means that that particular variable is true for um, at least 50% of the kids receiving discipline at your school. Same idea is true for the target group input tab. You click on that and then select your target group, and then you fill in the most common variables just for your target group, then uh, you'll be able to see which of these variables are representative for your target group. If you continue clicking along the bottom tabs, tab number four is your pattern comparison, and that sucks in the information from the previous two tabs that we were looking at there. And uh, if you just identify whether or not the target group and all students share the same variable, if you say that's a match, then you'll get all kinds of metrics specific to that particular variable. So for example, of the 270 referrals for open defiance, 52% were given to African American students. And then on the other side, of the 270 referrals for open defiance, 48% were given to all other students. So it'll give you some different metrics on those particular discipline variables. So that problem definition template is there for you guys to use. But what that'll do is it'll help you move from a broad statement that is shocking and something that you want to address. It'll be able to take you from just saying our Hispanic Latino students are nearly four times more likely to receive an office referral than all other students. You'll be able to say or to know that the most common behavior is disruption. It happens, or the most common location for Hispanic students to receive a referral is on the bus. Uh, the most common admin decision given to Hispanic students is a silent lunch. And the most common grade level for Hispanic students to receive a referral is kindergarten. So that gives you a much better sense of what the problem looks like at your school. That problem behavior template will also help you identify which of these variables are important to pay attention to. Uh, so for example, with kindergarten, that might be the most common grade level for Hispanic students who receive referrals. Uh, but if that's only true for 12% of Hispanic or Latino students who receive a referral, that particular variable isn't very representative of that group. Uh, you can contrast that with silent lunch. 86% of Hispanic Latino students who receive a referral received silent lunch as the consequence. So that is something that's true for the majority of kids in that group who are contacting discipline. That's something you would pay attention to. So now that you have that information, you move into data sharing. And with disproportionality data, a lot of folks um, get very hesitant about sharing that information out. But if you think about how we arrive at decisions, when we're trying to do group decision making, uh, we're presented with a new topic, and then people's ideas, they, they kind of spread out, and eventually they converge until they arrive at a mutual decision. So if we're having those conversations with people who are similar to us, and we're going to get a lot of familiar opinions, we're going to stay in mostly safe and familiar territory, and we're going to get obvious solutions as a result. And so my personal recommendation would be to just go ahead and check your tier one implementation because a lot of times that's where teams wind up when they're only talking amongst themselves. 
uh, when teams start to reach out to other staff members, to their families, and to their students. They're getting a lot more diverse perspectives, and it can sometimes be a bit overwhelming and uncomfortable, but that is also where the majority of growth occurs. Growth is not a painless process. Uh, so this might be difficult, but you're getting a lot broader ideas and feedback, and that's where you come up with those innovative and targeted solutions. So when you share data about disproportionality, um, actually you want to back up and first have a history of safe data sharing and set some norms for providing feedback on your discipline process. Um, it's a very difficult conversation to have with your faculty if the first conversation they're having about your discipline process is about why one group of students contacts that discipline process more often than anyone else. Um, so start by sharing data regularly with your faculty and getting their feedback on that discipline process independent of race. Just how is the discipline process working for you? You want to avoid jargon, establish common understanding, keep it simple, and do a lot of listening. These are listening sessions, not telling sessions. With our schools, we have them provide an open-ended question and just kind of take in anything that comes out as a result of that. Uh, the important points to note here is that we set the context for that conversation. So it's not just our school that has disproportionate outcomes. We show people how disproportionate discipline is a nationwide issue. Um, so we're starting to investigate that. This is what we've learned. How does that match up to your experience with discipline at our school? And then the types of information you get from that, it can be very wide ranging. Um, as you go, although you're doing a lot of listening at this point, you don't want to do any explaining the data or trying to make excuses. You just want to take it in. Um, but when you do speak, you want to be speaking in a way that shows that you've been paying attention to what people are saying. So using those active listening skills, do some paraphrasing um, so that people feel like they've been heard. The feedback that you get from that will be eye-opening. And the more you know about your quantitative data, uh, it'll tell you more about where your staff, where your students and families are uh, with regards to this particular problem. And so you can see, and these are actual quotes from faculty members who are seeing disproportionate discipline outcomes for their school for the first time. And so you can see that there are some statements that people share um, that, that connect to things like uh, the attitude of students, or um, they blame the neighborhood and family background they come from. So these are, are pretty questionable statements, and it tells maybe a little something about staff member bias. Um, or maybe what their needs for professional development are, at least what they believe their needs are. Um, you also have ideas coming up about the discipline process, about poverty, which is a myth. Uh, then we also um, have someone taking this to another extreme where they just assume that everybody is biased, and that's why we have disproportionate outcomes. And really, it could be something else. Maybe it's a policy that's not working. Um, maybe it's the way that we're addressing students um, as part of our greeting. It could be a number of things. Um, but regardless, this tells you a lot about where your staff are. Now, there's an app. It's called Nearpod, N-E-A-R-P-O-D. And uh, it's an online application, and it will allow you to pose a question. People go online. They type their answers completely anonymous. People can vote up the statements that they agree with. So this was an example where a school used that particular app, and it made it very easy for them to compile everyone's ideas. Once you do that, and you do that across stakeholders, then you can start to see that different groups will have some similar ideas, even though they might sound a little bit different. Um, so you might hear your faculty talk about how school discipline looks just like real life prison statistics. Um, and family might say, well, this occurs in law enforcement as well. Um, you can hear faculty saying things like, they run the streets more. Um, they, they don't have as much supervision. They have more freedom than other kids. Whereas the parents might say that um, more along the lines of there's a lack of parental involvement. Sue, I just saw your comment there. Nearpod is the name of that app. Not that I'm endorsing them. I'm just sharing a strategy from our school. So looking at feedback across different groups, you can also start to see two sides of the picture. So in this particular example, we have faculty saying that we're seeing these outcomes because teachers are frustrated with the school structure. 
um, that students are sent to the dean because a teacher has already been dealing with it in the classroom, they've had enough, and the kids are just more abrasive to the teachers. So the teacher's less likely to work it out with them. Families have similar ideas, but they have the opposite side there. Um, they're seeing that teachers need to be more compassionate and or patient, um, that the school needs to be more understanding of home life, and that we need to be aware of the whole child, um, and treat the whole child instead of just academics. The other real valuable thing here is that the families picked up on themes that were not at all identified by the faculty. So families mentioned that it seemed like there was an inconsistency with consequences, uh, discipline processes that were unclear. Uh, they need alternatives to suspension. Add in there, too, some common themes we hear from students, and then we really start to appreciate some of the things that are going on at school. Uh, what the students told us, and this was true across all grade levels, we did this in grades 4 through 12, is that students wanted to have uh, more of a voice in a disciplinary event, uh, so they didn't get to share their side of the story, and they really wanted to. Um, they say teachers label them based on things that happened in the past. But that teachers, this was a big one, teachers don't notice peers' racial comments. And so what they do notice is that students are responding to another student's statement that was derogatory and or hurtful. Uh, they notice some teachers like some students better. Uh, but then the other real valuable thing that came from that is that students wanted teachers' help. So where faculty might have been saying that the kids are more abrasive to teachers, the students were saying, we want your help. But they felt like they weren't really getting it. Um, at the secondary level, so at the high school level, uh, middle school and high school level, they were, the kids were more able to talk about racial differences that they see in discipline at their school. Um, they weren't surprised <laughs> by the issue. And uh, they could see where the issue varied from school to school. Um, so that was kind of a big deal for the teams. Everyone who went through those focus group processes, um, they had an absolute turning point after hearing from their families and students. So they didn't know what they were missing by not engaging in those conversations. And this particular process really helped them to get a better picture. So now what? Um, well, hopefully today, after today, you'll start to refine your own data system, working on that consistency, um, starting to get stakeholder perceptions on your overall discipline process now. Um, we want you to be able to pull information for your equity reports uh, by your data system, not hand tallies, which is actually what some of our schools have had to do in order to complete those equity profiles. Uh, we want you to use existing resources as much as possible. This is hard work, and so the data collection piece, the data reporting piece, should be one of the easiest pieces that you have. So the Swiss information system, schools can use that. It has a very small licensing fee every year. Um, and then I also shared with you the equity profile and problem definition template from our project. Um, talk with your district IT department so that you can easily access the reports you need. And then start to get that qualitative data so you can see the whole story. I want to remind folks about the National PBIS Center's recommendations about using disaggregated discipline data. And then we always advocate for a problem-solving process uh, to get at some of those root causes of discipline, remove some of those barriers. Um, beyond just the data, start building relationships with families who are impacted by your behavior support practices. So families of kids who are receiving the character ed, anti-bullying, families of kids who um, experience disproportionate discipline or restraint and seclusion, uh, engage in some personal development on different identity issues, start using inclusive language and practices, and advocate for policy changes so that you can better support all students. So there are a number of resources online for you. Uh, the National PBIS Center has several, and they actually just added a new one. Um, they updated their five-point intervention approach for enhancing equity in school discipline. Uh, the Discipline Disparities website is another great res resource. You can get research summaries, uh, summaries in Spanish, bibliographies, and promising programs. And then the Root Cause Analysis Guide is also available, and that will help you dig deeper into your school-wide data to really uncover the things that are leading to disproportionate outcomes.
As a plug for our conference coming up next month, you'll be able to find me and my colleagues there. Stephanie Mar Martinez is heading up a session on the family focus groups. Um, so if you're going, please check her out. And that's it. That's our contact information. So we do still have another minute or two uh, to look at some of the different questions. Um, Jared, I noticed you had one a little bit earlier about schools that have higher mobility. So what do I suggest as an enrollment number? I would suggest that you go with that cumulative enrollment. So your enrollment should reflect every kid who walks through your school building doors, uh, because every kid who comes through your doors has the opportunity to receive discipline. And so that will always guarantee that the number of kids receiving discipline is no greater than the number of kids enrolled, uh, which would be important for your metrics. Hope that answers your question there. Do folks have other questions, concerns, or would you like more information on something? I don't see any additional questions. Uh, thank you all for participating, and be sure to contact Therese at the number here if you have any questions.